start. Okay, let me go ahead and start this, and then we will, uh, as we're talking about uh, the homework schedule, while we're waiting for the rest of the people to come in. Um, so uh, we have this homework uh, 2.1 uh, that was due, uh, originally it was due this evening. I, I moved it back one day, so this is tomorrow, uh, to give you a little bit extra time to work on it, because maybe only... A little over half the class had worked on it as of this morning, so I want to give you all plenty of time to work on that one. Um, and then uh, coming up later in the week, uh, so this is a little bit odd day because usually things are due on Mondays and Wednesdays, but this one's due on Saturday, okay? So um, is that second uh, homework, which is actually kind of similar to 2.1. And... Um, Then I posted a new assignment, which is due a week from today, and that's the last thing that will be due before the test. So these are the things that are due prior to the test. So the test will cover up through this assignment. Notice there's a part two to this homework, uh, but that is not uh, really on the test, and uh, so that won't be due until after the test. Of course, there's also this algebra review for extra credit uh, that's due on... Um, uh, the day of the test, okay? Uh, that was due at 10, but I moved it back to 11.59, although it would benefit you to have it finished by the test because the purpose of the algebra review is so you won't make um, uh, silly algebra mistakes on the test. Uh, so that's the sequence of events between now and next Wednesday. So next Wednesday is the test, right? Okay, so you've got 10 days now to get ready for it. Um, I did post for you... A, um, hmm, why is it asking me that again? Okay, I did post for you a uh, uh, test review, okay? Uh, I, so it's uh, uh, on the Blackboard page under the sample test link, okay? So this is to give you an idea of the sorts of questions uh, and the format of the questions that will be on the test. We'll have to see if we get through all of this material that's on the sample test. It's a little hard for me to sometimes make out the sample test because I'm not sure where we're going to be uh, at the time of the test. But anyway, um, uh, so that is for you to practice with. Uh, so it's, it's not something that you're going to turn in. Okay, um, It's just to help you prepare for the test next Wednesday, okay? So you've got the homeworks that are due, so those are actually part of your grade, so you've, you've got to finish those. And then this is not really part of your grade, but it's still an additional way for you to practice for the test, uh, because sometimes uh, I can't always ask the test questions exactly the way they're asking the homework, although they're similar questions, so this will help you uh, get a better uh, uh, expectations of how I would pose questions uh, on test number one okay now there's a little bit of a caveat to that uh, which is um, uh, don't think that this is a duplicate of the first test okay this is a practice test but the problems on the first test are not going to be exactly the same as the problems on this test okay now nonetheless having said that I think it will definitely benefit you to uh, uh, print this and work on it, okay? So I definitely think you should take uh, the time to uh, practice this uh, before the test, okay? Uh, most people find that uh, ben beneficial, all right? Uh, so, and, uh, um, so I will post the answers. The answers are not posted. It's blank right now except for the questions. Uh, I don't want to post the answers too soon because I don't want you you know, looking at the answers while you're working on the practice test because that is not beneficial. That gives you a false sense of what you know. Uh, so you should try to work on it first and then go back and look at the answers and, you know, correct your mistakes or see what you got right, right? So that's the most effective way to use the, uh, to use the practice test. So it's on the Blackboard page under the sample tests uh, link, okay? Um, so that sort of squares everything away between now and um, uh, next Wednesday um, uh, when the test uh, is coming up. 
Um, I want y'all to do me a favor today. Um, I, uh, I'm going to try to avoid, in most cases, writing on the board and stick to writing on the tablet, uh, although it's very tempting sometimes to write on the board uh, for me. Um, uh, so if I start to write on the board, uh, try to get me to stop, okay, all right? So stop me and say, no, Dr. Wall, don't write on the board, so that we can have a complete record of everything um, in the notes, because the stuff that's appearing on the board is not in the notes, all right? Uh, I mean, that I write on the whiteboard is not in the notes, right? So it makes for uh, the, the video is not as effective if, if, you know, I'm talking about something and... It's not showing on the screen, okay? Uh, for those of you who are watching the uh, um, the videos, okay. Um, we're gonna answer questions about that 2.1 homework. If you have them, hang on to them for just a second. Um, I'm gonna do one more example from a prior notes that I had skipped, um, and then we'll look at this homework, and then we'll start talking about that screwdriver problem again, because that's the main thing uh, that we want to do today. And uh, when John passes out your name tag, he's going to pass out a little uh, activity sheet uh, that um, uh, has got some, you know, uh, just uh, uh, practice problems for us. And I hope to get to one of those today um, after we uh, finish that screwdriver example. We're going to have to see how far we make it. Um, so that's where we're at. Let me go to, um, yeah, let me go to this note. So this is... Uh, one of the prior notes, and there was one more example in this page of notes that um, I, we didn't uh, get to. So I want to finish this one because it's kind of uh, useful in the homework 2.1. So you might have questions about this one uh, when you're doing that uh, homework 2.1. Okay. So it's a pretty straightforward problem, uh, except that the second part here uh, involves uh, a little bit of may involve a little bit of algebra uh, that may. Um, uh, cause you some issues, okay? So it's not hard, but uh, if you haven't seen it before, then um, it's easy to get sort of jumbled up there uh, in the algebra. All right, so uh, it's again, it's a very straightforward problem. We're just given this function formula. Uh, f of x is 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. So that's not a linear function, not a linear function, right? Because we have the uh, x squared term in the formula. So if this were just f of x equal 3x minus 1, then when it said find the average rate of change from 1 to 3, you would say, oh, that's easy because that's the same as the slope, right? Okay. For linear functions, the average rate of change, remember, is the same as the slope always, no matter what two values uh, uh, you're calculating the average rate of change for. But this is not a linear function all right, because of that 2x squared term in the formula. So, so this actually is going to require us to do a little bit of... Uh, 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 a little bit of work, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's that's first what we want to do, and then we're going to calculate the average rate of change, uh, but for some uh, symbolic expressions, okay? Um, this one is just for the average rate of change between two input numbers, and this is the average rate of change between two input numbers, but notice the second input number uh, involves uh, a symbolic expression, okay? Uh, and you can go ahead and still calculate the average rate of change. It's just that uh, uh, your answer is not going to come out as a pure number, all right? All right, so let's do the first one here first, okay? What's the average rate of change of this function? We mean the function outputs, right? from x equals 1 to x equals 3. So uh, uh, to apply that average rate of change formula, let's go ahead and uh, label the 1 and 3. So I'm going to call this x sub 1, and let's call this x sub 2, because this is the smaller value and this is the larger value, although it really doesn't matter which one you call x1 and x2. Uh, you'll still get the right value even if you mislabel the x1 and the x2. Okay. So, so the average rate of change, right? We've got to remember our average rate of change formula. So this is an important formula that you'll want to remember for the test, right? Uh, however, oh, there's one thing I forgot to tell you about the test, okay? Uh, on the test, you can bring an index card, okay? Right, an index card, all right? And you can have anything on that index card that you like, all right? So you can have the lyrics to your favorite song or uh, whatever you want, whatever inspires you, okay, right? Uh, uh, an inspirational poem, perhaps, okay? Uh, but uh, more than likely, you may want to include there some uh, hints for 
the mathematics, right, okay, uh, that we've been doing uh, since it's going to be a math test. Now, how big thing can the index card be? I really don't care. There's only really three sizes of index cards you can buy. So you can make the index card, uh, I think the biggest size is four by six, or maybe it's five by seven. You can have that size index card. That's fine. This is not, this is a smaller size, okay? There's a slightly bigger size than this. It cannot be, however, the size of the desk, okay? So don't try to find an index card the size of the desk or even the size of, you know, like a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, right, okay? Uh, a standard size index card, all right, okay? Um, and you can, you can, so you can bring that to the exam, and you can bring that to any other exam, all right? So what I would do, actually, my strategy would be to uh, keep the, try to keep the same index card. Maybe this isn't a good strategy, but this would be my strategy. Try to keep the uh, uh, same index card throughout the semester, you know, and just start adding things to it right through the semester. Uh, uh, and... Um, you know, so that by the, you know, the end of the class there on the final exam, you know, you have this sort of complete index card with, you know, all the key things that you need to be reminded of, right, uh, when you uh, come to take the uh, final exam. And you don't have to remake the index card for every test, but uh, it's up to you how you want to do that, okay? Um, all right, but other than that, the, the test, of course, is, is closed notes, right, okay? Um, all right, so uh, so the average rate of change formula might be a useful thing to put on your index card. So what is that average rate of change formula when you're given a function formula like this? Well, remember, it's what? It's f of x2, right, uh, minus f of x1, and then divided by uh, x2 minus x1. So it's really the same as the slope formula, right? Okay, if you think of that f of x2 as being an output value, you can call that y2. And you can think of f of x1 also as being an output value, which it is, and you call that y1, then really see the numerator of that um, uh, average rate of change formula is really just y2 minus y1, and then you divide this by x2 minus x1 to calculate the average rate of change, and that's really the same as the slope formula. So um, when you calculate an average rate of change, remember you're calculating the slope of a secant line, okay? The slope of a secant line, that's a line that connects two points on the curve, okay? Uh, when you graph this uh, formula, you're going to get a curve. You're not going to get uh, a straight line, all right? Okay, so uh, let's go off to the side here. We've got to calculate um, these values, right? So we have to calculate f of 3, and we have to calculate f of 1, and then we're going to divide that by 3 minus 1, right? So that denominator is so easy, that's just going to be 2, okay? And now let's find f of 3. Well, let me go ahead and do it right here. I was going to do it off to the side, but let's go ahead and do it right in the right as part of the expression. So that's 2 times 3 squared plus 3 times 3, right, minus 1. I'm just plugging 3 in, right, uh, into the formula. And then we're going to subtract off f of 1. You're subtracting off all of f of 1, so I'm going to put that calculation for f of 1 inside parentheses. That's really helpful, by the way, so uh, to help you avoid arithmetic mistakes. So you have 2 times 1 squared plus 3 times 1 and then minus 1. But all of this is in parentheses, and you're subtracting all of that, right? Let me give myself a little bit of room here now. All right, so let's see. What's this going to be? Well, 3 squared is 9. 2 times 9 is 18. Plus 3 times 3 is 9 again, right? And then you're minusing, subtracting off the 1. And then inside the parentheses here, you have 2 times 1 squared. Well, that's going to be just 2 because 1 squared is 1. Plus 3 times 1 is 3 and then minus 1, right? So all of this divided by 2. So now I think I can actually do some of this arithmetic. There's 18 plus 9 is 27, right? Minus 1 is 26. So you have 26 minus, and then inside parentheses, that's 4, correct? Because 2 plus 3 is 5. Minus 1 is 4. All of this divided by 2. So you get 22 over 2, which is a um, pretty big average rate of change there. Uh, that is 11. So there's our average um, there's our average rate of change for that particular function. Okay, uh, the interpretation of this um, is a little bit. Uh, if you interpret this value in this context, um, it's a little bit uh, comes out a little bit dry interpretation because 
you don't know how this function is being used in practice, but you can write down an interpretation. So you would say, as always, when you begin these average rate of change interpretations, you would say, on average, right, from um, uh, x equals uh, 1 to x equals 3, right? Okay, and then this is where it gets hard to make the interpretation because you don't know what the output quantity is, you don't know what the input quantity is. So you would just have to say the outputs, you, I mean, you just can't be any more specific than that, uh, are what? Are they increasing or decreasing? Yeah, they're increasing. by 11 and then you've got to put the per uh, 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 amount in here okay but again since you don't know what the x is measuring it's kind of hard to say per what right is it per year or per pound or per so you just have to be very non-specific here and I'll say something like per unit change uh, in x Or you could say, um, that sounds a little bit artificial, you could also say uh, uh, the outputs are increasing by 11 each time x increases by 1. All right, okay, that might be a little bit more for familiar way of uh, putting it. All right, that's it. So there's the interpretation for that average rate of change, and that's just about the best we can say because we don't know how this function is being used uh, in practice. All right, all right, now let's... Let's uh, uh, find the average rate of change again, but this time again from 2. So we're starting at a number like we did in this example, but here we're going over to this variable quantity as the second input. Okay, So the second input is going to be 2 plus some little increment here. All right, So that could be uh, you know, 2 plus 3 or 2 plus 2 or 2 plus 1 or just 2 plus some amount, right? Okay. And, uh, but nevertheless, we're going to come out with some expression for uh, this average uh, rate of change from our number uh, starting at 2 and then to some number a little bit bigger than 2, depending on how big we make this h value, right? Okay. So we're starting at 2, so let's call that x sub 1 for the purposes of the formula. And then we're going over to 2 plus h, a number a little bit bigger than 2, right? So we'll call that x sub 2 for uh, the purposes of the formula. All right, so let's see if we can now, I think I've got, ooh, wow, where'd I go? There we go. All right, so let's see now if we've got, uh, I've got room here. Good. All right, so let's uh, do the calculation. So the average rate of change Unfortunately, we don't have a good notation for average rate of change. I wish I had some mathematical notation for that, so I don't, I wouldn't have to write down uh, the words average rate, of, average rate of change every time. But there's no sort of commonly accepted mathematical notation for average rate of change. I don't know why not. All right, someone should have invented one. Maybe I'll invent one, but um, not one so far. All right. So remember, the formula is f of x2 minus f of x1, right, over. Uh, x2 minus x1. So let's fill in those values, right? So we have f of 2 plus h, because that's what we're using for the x2, right? Minus f of x1. So that's easy. That's just f of 2. And then divided by 2 plus h minus 2. Well, that denominator turns out to be really easy, right? <laughs> okay, because that's just going to turn out to be h because those twos will cancel out. So in the denominator here, you're going to get whatever that little tiny increment is, h, okay? And now let's see what happens to the, now let's see what happens to the numerator, okay? So this is the hard part of calculating the numerator because you've got to plug that 2 plus h into the formula for um, x. So let's see, what was that? Now that was 2 times x squared, right? So you would have 2 times 2 plus h squared, and then what else went with that? Was it minus, plus, plus 3x? So you'd have plus 3 times 2 plus h, right? And then that's where the minus was, right? Wasn't it minus 1? Okay. So that is the f of uh, 2 plus h. 
okay? And then you're subtracting off f of 2. So remember, since you're subtracting off f of 2, put all of that calculation in parentheses. So you're going to have 2 times 2 squared plus 3 times 2 and then minus 1, okay? Well, I can do what's in the... We've already simplified the denominator. That's just easy. That's h. And inside the parentheses, this is easy, right? Because you're going to have 2 times 2 squared. So that's going to be 2 times 4. That's 8. And then plus 3 times 2. So that's easy. That's 6. And then minus 1. So no problem with what's in the parentheses. That looks like 13, right? 8 plus 6 minus 1 is 13. But this is the part where students often get confused, okay? And actually, it's not this part, because 3 times 2 plus h minus 1, that's easy. It's this part, okay? And so you're prone to making uh, one of two mistakes that, I, that I've already warned you about in the class, right? Okay? One of them is you're going to want to multiply the 2 into the 2 plus h first. You cannot do that, okay? Exponents come first. So first, you've got to take the 2 plus h and square it. In the order of operations, you've got to square 2 plus h first. And your second mistake that you're likely to make is, uh, is doing this uh, operation too easy. When you're squaring the 2 plus h, you're going to think that's 2 squared plus h squared. Okay? But it's not. All right? It's a little bit more complicated than that. Right? You have to take the 2 plus h and multiply it by itself. All right? So you have to expand that product a little bit more carefully than just 2 squared plus h squared. So be careful of that mistake. Let's see what happens over here. This part I said was easy, right? 3 times 2 is 6. You're just going to distribute that 3. So 3 times 2 is 6. And then 3 times h is 3h. And then we still have, I ran out of room there. We still have a minus 1. And then this minus sign also, OK? So that part is easy. That's 6 plus 3h minus 1. OK, now how do we do this? Well, let's go ahead and multiply the 2 plus h times the 2 plus h first. And then I'll multiply in the 2. So what's 2 plus h times 2 plus h? It's every term in the first one by every term in the second one. So 2 times 2 is 4. And then you have 2 times h is 2h. And then you have h times 2 which I'm also going to write that as 2h. And then you have h times h, which is h squared. Plus 6, plus 3h, minus 1, minus, let's see, what was all this in parentheses there? I think I said that was 13, right? All this divided by h. Now you can go ahead, if you want to, and multiply in the 2, okay, that's outside this first set of parentheses. So you get 8 plus 4h plus 4h again plus 2h squared and then finally plus the 6 plus the 3h minus 1 minus 13. All of this divided by h. And now just add your like terms together. So let's see, what like terms do we have? We have a bunch of h's, right? So I've got a, a 4h plus 4h is 8h plus another 3h is, how many h's did I end up with? 11. So I got 11h. So let's write that. Those are all taken care of now. And then I have a 2h squared, right? That's just the only h squared term I have. So let's write that down. 2h squared. And then let's see, what constants do I have? I have an, so I have an 8 and a 6 is 14, minus 1 is 13, minus 13 is, oh, 0? So that went away? Oh, how nice. So all those just cancel each other out. So that's simplifying really nicely. And now, notice, this is really convenient because you can divide h into both of these terms. See, h divides into 11h, and h divides into 2h squared. So you end up there with what? What's 11h divided by h? 11. 
And 2H squared divided by H is what? 2H. There you have it, right? Okay. Notice it's kind of like the first one. The first one we ended up with 11, right? Here we ended up also with the 11, but with that 2H added on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would still be correct, yeah, okay. You would just, when you simplify, you'd have 2H plus 11, but that's the same, yeah, okay, right. So, uh, ha, that's it, all right, okay. So, uh, that's the final, that's the final answer, all right. This one is really difficult to interpret because it's not a, just a value by itself, right. It has a variable in it, so, um, I wouldn't try to, probably not going to try to write down an interpretation of that average rate of change, okay, because it's really going to come out looking kind of awkward, all right? <clears throat> but that's, that's it, okay? So your average rate of change from 2 to 2 plus h turns out to be 11 plus uh, 2h, okay? <clears throat> So I just wanted to finish off those examples. Let me say, oh, well, I'll save that later. Before I go back and now, let's see if y'all uh, have any questions that you want to ask about 2.1 because this is, I think you have to do this kind of operation in some of the problems in 2.1, okay? So calculating, there's a lot of average rate of change problems in 2.1. Uh, and some of them involve average rate of change uh, from uh, a quantity uh, to a um, just an expression like 2 plus h. Any particular questions there? That was so easy? Yeah, I haven't worked on it enough, I think, is the issue here, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Number what? On this one? On 2.1? Okay. Let's see if we can get that open. So, did you say this one or 20? What? Three. Oh, I thought you said 2E. I didn't see an E there, so. The whole thing? Just B. Okay. All right. So um, let's see. What does this represent? Let's read the story. Uh, so our input here is elapsed years, and this, uh, the outputs here are sales of services, okay, uh, by some staffing firm, okay. Um, all right. So there, and this, these are measured at. Ooh, these are big amounts, okay, because those are thousands of millions of dollars okay so there's a uh, big company there all right and um, all right so uh, first thing we want to do there is calculate the average rate of change right from 2004 to 2007 all right okay and then interpret the result and then we want to calculate the percent change from 2007 to 2008, all right, and then also interpret the result. But they're going to help us a little bit there in interpreting the result because we've just got some uh, some boxes to fill in, okay? So on the test, uh, we won't have, um, on the test there, uh, won't have um, uh, the boxes to fill in. So you will have to write down the interpretation sort of from scratch, right? Okay. So when you're going through your homeworks uh, and looking at these interpretations, be sure you're reading what it's saying, right? So that you think you can uh, duplicate that, okay, from scratch. Um, and uh, uh, that's where the practice test would, uh, that's where the practice test would help. All right. Uh, all right. Let's see now. So, um, um, uh, y'all, so let's uh, find some space here. Uh, in the notes, okay, and um, let's calculate then this percent change, all right? So these are the two uh, points on the graph, right, okay, uh, that are important to us because we want to calculate that percent change between 2007 and 2008, all right? So y'all going to help have to help me remember this because I'm not going to remember this when I switch back to the notes. So the two points were 7 and 57.82, right, and then 8 and 56.91, okay?
Let me see if I can add a page here. Ah, there we go. Okay. So let's see. What were those two uh, points? Seven and what? What now? 57.82 and then what? Eight and 56.91. Was that it? All right. So I'm going to calculate the percent change, right? Okay. So what's our formula for, um, what's our formula there for, uh, percent change, right? Remember, it's what? Last, right? Uh, minus first, correct? Okay. Divided by the first, right? And then you're going to you're going to uh, uh, convert that to a percentage. So we'll multiply that by 100%. Uh, all right. Um, remember now, when it says last and first here, they're not talking about the inputs, right? Okay. So don't plug, put in the eight and the seven there, right? Okay. Uh, they're talking about the outputs, all right? So we're always calculating uh, uh, average rate of change of outputs or uh, change in outputs or percent change uh, in outputs, right? Okay. So we have there what? Um, the last one is 56.91 minus 57.82, right? Okay. Divided by the. 57.82, okay, and then we want to uh, convert that to 100%. So 56.91 uh, uh, minus uh, 57.82, is that minus 91? Am I doing that right? Divided by 57.82 and then times 100%, and they want us to um, uh, do that calculation to, was it three decimal places? Okay, so what does that work out to be to three decimal places? I know it's going to be a minus sign there. 1.573, well, do you know what the fourth digit was? 85? Okay. Oh, so actually, if we round that to, um, so this is percent. So actually, if we round that, right, it's going to be, is it 574? Okay, all right. <clears throat> So it looks like minus point uh, uh, minus 1.574%, uh, all right? Did you get that number, or did you have a different graph? You did not get that number? Oh, you used the 7 and an 8 somewhere in your calculations? Okay, yeah, right. So that was just what I was cautioning you about, right? Okay, yeah, so we're always calculating the uh, uh, change or percent change or the average rate of change just in the outputs, right? Okay, so the inputs are not, well, no, that's not quite correct, but in the percent change formula, the inputs are not going to enter into the uh, the inputs are not going to enter into the calculation, right? Okay. One thing that's nice about percent change, though, is uh, this comes out as a percentage. So um, you don't have when you do an interpretation, you don't have to worry about um, the units of measure, right? Because this is just a percentage. So it makes the interpretation easier uh, to give for percent change. Okay. All right. So let's go back. Minus 1.574. Hope we got that right. Minus one, because I can't figure out what the mistake would be. All right, percent. Okay, and then our interpretation. Let's see what they give us here. So between 2007 and 2008, the sales what decreased, right? By, and then there you just have to repeat the percentage, right? But don't put the negative sign in there, okay? Because that is accounted for with the decreased, right? Okay, yeah. Y'all think we got it right? That part? Okay, yeah, all right. So, does that help? All right. Okay. So, yeah, so though... Um, Actually, all three of those types of change are involved in this problem. So uh, this is actually good practice, right? You've got the average rate of change, right? So there you've got to uh, remember the average rate of change formula. The percent is involved, right? Okay. So you've got to remember the percent change formula. And then just the plain old change, which is easy. That was the, uh, 
That was the minus 91. Well, for this problem, it was minus 91. I'm not sure what it is from 2004 to 2008. Okay, so they're all involved in that particular um, in that particular example. Okay. Um, other questions there? Yes. Number six. Okay, so can we do, um, oh, that's five, okay. I was going to say, can we do one of those? All right, Ooh, let's see if we can figure out what this was saying. All right, so it says um, uh, f of x is the number in thousands of vehicles, okay, um, that a manufacturer estimates will be sold uh, when X million dollars are spent on advertising, okay, so it says F of 1.6 is 220 and F of 2.5 is 325, compute the average rate of change, right, uh, uh, between 1.6 and 2.4. Oh, there's the notation that I was looking for. Um, there is the notation for average rate of change, okay? Th that is the Greek letter delta, which is often used to represent uh, 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 change, okay? So that is kind of a, a, a shorthand version of the average rate of change formula. That means the change in the outputs, right, from uh, 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 this point on the graph to this point in the graph, divided by the change in the inputs, okay? From, again, from uh, this point on the graph to this point uh, on the graph, okay? Ah, so we'll have to, we're going to have to remember that, all right? Um, so there's a shorthand. If you don't want to write down uh, the words average rate of change, that's what that uh, notation means. Is that what, what it was throwing you? Okay, no? Or is it just the calculations? <laughs> all right, okay. Let's see if we can, um, uh, let's see if we can uh, do the calculations, right? So you may have, do you have different numbers? All right, so uh, you'll just have to uh, uh, sort of repeat what I do here with your values, okay? All right, so y'all help me remember this. F of 1.6 was 220, and F of uh, 2.4 was uh, 325, okay? All right, so let's go back and... Um, Write that down, okay? So F of 1.6 was what? 220. And F of 2.4 was, um, was it 325? Yeah, 325, okay? So see, this is going to be in that average rate of change um, formula. That's going to be the X1, and that's going to be the... Um, x2 you see okay so our average rate of change which in that homework there this is how their their shorthand for this delta f divided by delta x okay but the formula is still the same, right? It's f of x2, no matter what notation you use for it, it's f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by uh, x2 minus x1, okay? So we've got all the values here to fill in, right, okay? Because we know f of x2, there it is, it's 325, you see? And the f of x1 is 220, and now we're dividing that by 325 minus... Oops, <laughs> sorry. We're dividing that by the x values, right? Which are uh, 2.4 minus 1.6, right? So let's see, that numerator, that's pretty easy. That looks like 105 divided by 2.4 minus 1.6. That is 0.8, okay? And remember, this is not a percentage, right? This is not a percentage. So you don't have to multiply here by 100%, uh, uh, okay? So we divide 105 by 0.8. That's going to give us a number a little bit bigger than 105, right? Because you're dividing by something slightly less than 1. What does that work out to be? 131.25. 131.25? All right, okay. So there's our average rate of change, 
point uh, two five. Okay, and we're going to round to one decimal place. So that looks like one thirty one point three, right? Okay, because we're going to have to round that up because of that um, 0.5. All right. All right, let's see now if we can write down the interpretation. So again, uh, in this, uh, in, because they're just having you fill in blanks in this template, the interpretation there uh, in the homework is a little bit easier than it's going to be on the test. So it's really important that you, I, now I really uh, uh, stress looking at the practice test and looking at uh, interpretation problems on the practice test and get used to writing down the full interpretation. Okay, so let's see. Um, wow, okay. Is that the part that was confusing? They have a very strange um, interpretation here. This is not the interpretation that I would uh, uh, expect, okay. So, if spending on advertising is um, increased, right, from 1.6 to what, 2.4, right, okay, million dollars, then the number of vehicles sold is it increases, right? Okay, at a rate of what was our um, average rate of change there? 131.3. Okay, all right. So, it, in in essence, what that here's the interpretation I would give, right? So, on average, right, from uh, 1.6 to 2.4, right? Okay, uh, the number of vehicles sold increases, right, by um, 131.3, um, is it vehicles there? Yeah, okay, per million dollars spent, all right. What? Oh, it's measured in thousands, so I have to convert this to um, thousands. Maybe I better not put the comma there. So let's just multiply that by, uh, let's just multiply that result by 1,000, right? Okay, so we get 131,300. Here you can leave it as 131.3, right? But in the interpretation, uh, since the uh, number of vehicles is thousands, and they didn't say thousands of vehicles here, they just said vehicles, we need to multiply our average rate of change by 1,000. Okay, uh, to get the interpretation right. Okay, let's see if we got that right. <clears throat> Are they going to go back and expect that the? Uh, we got it right. Okay, great. So again, my uh, 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 way of writing down the interpretation is slightly different than this. Again, I would just say on average from uh, 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 x equal 1.6 to x equal 2.4, the number of vehicles sold increased by 131,300 per million dollars spent. All right. So the first part of that sentence I wouldn't uh, express the same way okay, um, as they did. Do <laughs> you understand what you did wrong? Okay. All right. So any more questions there? Yeah. Number four, right? Okay. Let's see. So this figure shows the median age at first marriage for men in the United States from 1970 to 2007. So, uh, 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 and we're, we're measuring our inputs in elapsed years. So let's see what was happening. In 1970, uh, men were getting married uh, uh, typically at uh, age 23.3, but that had gone up by, this is 2007, right? Okay, 37 years after 1970. That had gone up by a little bit more than four years because then the median age was um, so the typical age at first marriage there was 27.7 uh, uh, 
Okay, so uh, the question here now is uh, this is really uh, uh, an average rate of change question, but they kind of have it in disguise. Okay, so uh, it says calculate how much and how rapidly the median age increased from 1970 through 2007. And again, we're going to, they're asking for a huge number of decimal places, which I think is ridiculous, but there it is, right? So we've got to give three decimal places there. So the first box there they want is just what? What should we put in there? So what type of change goes in that first box? That's just the change, right? Okay. So from 1970 to 2007, right, uh, that, uh, uh, that median age increased from 23.3 to 27.7. So there they're just asking for the change. That's easy to calculate because that's just x2 minus x1, right? So is that 4.4? Yeah. So that one's pretty obvious what they're asking for there. We just type in what the change is. But I guess we have to type it into three decimal places. So let me type in a couple of extra zeros there. Right, but the how rapidly now that gets into uh, uh, the rate of change. Okay, so when you're asked how rapidly a quantity is increasing or decreasing, what you're asking for is a rate. So here we want to calculate the average rate of change from uh, uh, 23 point. Uh, I'm sorry, from uh, 1970 to uh, 2007. Okay, all right. <clears throat> So again, let's go back to the notes here. We just have to remember the uh, values there that were given to us on the graph. So the first point there was 0 and 23.3, right? And the second one was 37 and was it 27.7, right? So the average rate of change, again, is just going to be the change, which is the 27.7 minus the 23.3, right? Okay, this is the x1, and this is the x2 here, right? So this is uh, f of x2, and this is f of x1. So 27.7 minus 23.3, and then divided by um, the length of that interval, right? Which is going to be x2 minus x1, 37 minus uh, 0. So again, not a percentage here. So we get the change, which was 4.4, right, divided by the 37. Can you all do that calculation for me? 0 0.118. And what was the fourth Nine. decimal? Nine. Okay. So if we round that off to three, that looks like 119. Yeah. Okay. So how rapidly uh, was that uh, 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 median age increasing, right? Well, it was increasing by about uh, point, um, yeah, point one one nine. Okay, uh, don't know what point one one nine, right? Okay, uh, years. Okay each calendar year, right? So uh, each calendar year between 1970 and 2007, the median age went up by 0.119 years. That's a little bit confusing, right? Because the, um, uh, the units of measure on the input and the units of measure on, uh, on the input and the units of measure on the output are both the same, right? They're both years. So you see years twice there. But this is years age and this is uh, calendar year. So uh, on average, but remember that's on average, right? Okay, uh, the uh, that typical age went up by 0.119 years each calendar year per year, right? So let's see now. Let's see if we can. So does that make sense? Whoever asked that question, who asked that question, right? Okay. Um, now let's see if we can answer this second part. So uh, and I think we just do this by observing the graph. So it said, did the median age at first marriage grow at the same rate? from 1970 to 2000 as it did from 2000 to 2007, okay? So from 1970 to 2000, that's right here, right? Okay, uh, as it did from 
2000 to 2007. Okay. All right. There are two ways of answering this question. Okay. Two ways of answering this question. One of them, you can do it very precisely by actually calculating the average rates of change between those two time intervals. All right. So you can calculate the average rate of change from 1970 to 2000 right here. Okay. 1970 to 2000 right there and see what value you get and then turn around and calculate the uh, the average rate of change from 2000 to 2007 so calculate the average rate of change from 30 to 37 right here right okay uh, and just compare those two values and see which one is larger that's the precise way of answering the question but this one because they're not actually uh, 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 asking you for the specific numbers you can also answer that one a little bit more intuitively okay because remember average rate of change is the slope of the secant line right that connects the two points on the graph so think about the po think about the line that's connecting I can't draw it here on the screen but think about the line that's connecting these two points and then the line that's connecting these two points. Which of those is going to have steeper slope? The first one going from here to here or the second one going from here to here? What did you say? The second one, right. The second one is a little bit steeper. That's correct. Okay. It's just a little bit more upright than the first one, correct? And you can just see that visually. So that tells you that that second average rate of change is going to be higher because remember the average rate of change is the slope of the secant line. So if I could draw on the screen here, we could actually draw those two secant lines in and you can see what you can visualize anyway, right? Uh, the second secant line is going to have a little bit steeper slope than the first secant line. So that means that actually, um, what's the answer to our question? Uh, no? Yeah, okay. It didn't grow at the same rate, right? Okay, actually, it grew faster from 2000 to 2007 than it did from 1970 to 2000, right? Okay, they did not grow at the same uh, rate at any rate. Okay. Um, does that make sense to everybody? What I was visualizing there? This part of the curve is a little bit steeper than this part of the curve. Okay. Right? Because this secant line is not going to be as steep as this secant line is going to be if you visualize those two secant lines. So the answer there actually is I think no. Are we going to get this one right? Gosh, I hope so. Yeah, I get a little excited every time y'all submit an answer when you're doing this one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we got that one. Uh, we got that one right. Okay. <clears throat> Yay for us. All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's go back now. We really have to go back and look at the notes. So I, I hope that's enough now to um, uh, 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 get y'all finished there. Those are good problems. Okay. So I hope you're thinking about the problems. Uh, uh, and reflecting on them when you're doing your homework. By, by the way, one other thing also, I hope that um, uh, uh, you're writing your work down somewhere where you can keep track of it. I see a lot of you have notebooks, which is very good, but uh, I hope you're not just scribbling on you know, a piece of toilet paper or something when you're uh, doing the uh, 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 answer. So you can go back and um, you know, have that to refer to, right, uh, when you're preparing for the... Um, when you're preparing for the test. Okay, well, wow, we did so many uh, average rate of change problems there that um, this example now, the first part of this example is going to be a little bit boring, okay? Um, all right, because it's an average rate of change again. Uh, so remember, uh, last time we were um, uh, dropping this screwdriver off of uh, this building, okay? Dropping a screwdriver off of the building. And this formula gives us the height of the screw. This is a famous formula from physics, okay? A famous formula from physics. This gives us the height of the screwdriver uh, after um, a given number of seconds, okay? Uh, this is the height is measured in feet uh, after a given number of seconds, okay? And that formula was discovered by uh, Galileo, okay? Um, uh, that's one of his important discoveries. Uh, one of the things that got Galileo thrown in jail uh, by the Inquisition, okay? Um, but that wasn't the only thing, all right? Um, all right, so last time we were just, evalu we were just using that formula to evaluate uh, and interpret um, 
you know what is f of zero we calculate that's easy to calculate that's 400 and that just told us that the initial height of the screwdriver was 400 feet right okay and then we evaluated and interpreted f of three there's the calculation that we went through and that told us that after three seconds the height of the screwdriver is only 256 feet right okay all right now uh, uh, uh now let's use that information to calculate an average rate of change okay so this is now old hat to you because uh, we've just practiced that so let's calculate the average rate of change there um from x equals zero to x equals three all right so what was the average rate of change in the height of that screwdriver right uh from time zero that's when it's initially dropped to three seconds okay so now that we've already calculated f of um, 3 and um, f of um, 0, then uh, all we have to do is plug those values into our average rate of change formula. So we're going to get f of 3 minus f of 0 divided by 3 minus 0. So f of 3, uh, that's 256. There it is. We calculated that last time. Okay, so we don't have to recalculate that, and then uh, you can if you if you like, and then f of zero was 400, so that's just off the screen there. But f of zero was 400. That was the initial height of the screwdriver, and now we want to divide this all by three. So that's minus 144 divided by three. What's 144 divided by three? Negative 48. Okay. All right. So what does that tell us? Okay, about the what does that tell us there about the screwdriver? Well, now we're pros at interpreting this average rate of change, right? So we know on average, right, from uh, x equals zero to x equals three, right? Um, the screwdriver. What happened to the screwdriver? Or the height of the screwdriver. Yeah, the height of the screwdriver was decreasing, right? Okay. In other words, the screwdriver fell. Okay. Yeah, when your height is decreasing, that means you're falling, right? Okay. So the screwdriver fell by, and then what rate there? So that's where the calculation comes in. 48, and what units do we put on this? How fast is it falling? Feet per second, right? Okay. So on average, over the first three seconds, that screwdriver was falling by 48 feet per second, okay, 48 feet per second. But keep in mind, that's what's happening on average because the, the uh, rate at which that screwdriver is falling is not steady, okay, it's not steady because this screwdriver is falling under the influence of gravity, right, and so it is speeding up as it falls, okay. So if you draw a picture Here's actually a graph of that function. So this is not the path of the screwdriver, keep in mind, but this is a graph of that function, 400 minus 16x squared. And if you connect these two points on the graph with a secant line, that slope of that secant line there is going to be that minus 48. Okay, so if the screwdriver had fallen at a steady rate of 48 feet per second, that's not the way objects work under the influence of gravity, right? But if the screwdriver had sort of floated down, right, at a steady rate of 48 feet per second, then here's what this graph would have looked like. Okay, it would have looked like this straight line connecting these two points. But that's not how the screwdriver fell, right? At first, the screwdriver was dropping kind of slowly when it was first released. And then, of course, as the gravity took hold, then the screwdriver started speeding up. So when we calculate the average rate of change again, let's calculate the average rate of change from the third second to the fifth second. By the way, that's when the screwdriver hits the ground. Okay, of course, what's going to happen? Well... When you calculate the average rate of change from the third second to the fifth second, you're calculating the slope of this secant line, right? And that secant line is much steeper, right, than the first secant line, correct? So guess what? That average rate of change uh, 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 the second time is going to be what? 
It's actually, well, these are negative numbers, so it's actually going to be much smaller, right? Okay. In other words, the screwdriver is dropping a lot faster. Okay. The screwdriver is dropping a lot faster uh, uh, from three seconds to five seconds, right, than it was in the first uh, three seconds. Okay. All right. So let's calculate that really quickly. And we can do this one really fast because we are really good at this now. All right. So average rate of change from the third second to the fifth second. Let's see, that's going to be f of 5 minus f of 3 over 5 minus 3. So the denominator is easy. That's 2. f of 5, if you want to, you can go back and calculate f of 5 in the formula. But can you see what f of 5 is going to be by looking at the graph there? What's f of 0, right? Okay, because that's when the screwdriver hits the ground. So let's just plug that one in. F of 5 is 0. F of 3, we already knew, was 256, right? Okay, because we calculated that a moment ago. So we have here minus 256 divided by 2, and that comes out to be minus 128, right? Okay, and so see, we were, you know, our intuition is exactly correct, right? Because we've all fallen down enough to know this, right? Okay, um, uh, uh, from the third second to the fifth second, that screwdriver is dropping by 128 feet per second. So it's speeded up quite a bit. Gravity is really strong. Okay. So when you uh, drop an object, right, uh, it speeds up very quickly. That's why when you fall down, it hurts. Okay. Uh, you don't fall very far. Okay. But it doesn't take very long for gravity to get you moving really quickly. Okay. Uh, so when you hit the ground, you're going to hit the ground at a pretty good speed, even though you're only falling for a fraction of a second. All right. Now, as I mentioned last time, though, we're usually not interested when we're measuring the speed of objects, right? We're usually not interested how fast they're moving on average over a particular time interval. What we want to know is how fast is the average, go how fast is the uh, object going at a particular time? So that's what we want to try to figure out now. How fast was that screwdriver falling after exactly two seconds? So right here on the graph. After two seconds, where's that on the graph there? So two seconds is about right there, right? Okay. Right at that instant, if we had a speedometer on that screwdriver, if we had a speedometer on that screwdriver, what would the speedometer read? Okay. Our speedometer has to measure feet per second, okay, not miles per hour. But if we had a, screw, a, a, a speedometer attached to that screwdriver, how, what would that speedometer read? Uh, tell us, okay, about the speed of the screwdriver right there, okay? All right, here's the game we're going to play. This is really the secret to calculus. You are now getting ready to learn the secret to calculus, okay? Um, I can't answer that question just by looking at this graph the way it's drawn now, okay? But I claim if I zoom in just on this little piece of the graph right here around two seconds, Okay, so I'm going to zoom really, really close in on the graph, this little piece of the graph right here after two seconds, and then I'm going to look at that graph, and that's going to give me a strong clue as to what the answer to this question is. Okay, so we're now getting ready to calculate not an average rate of change, but an instantaneous rate of change. How fast was the screwdriver dropping right at this instant? Right at this instant. Okay. Now, how is, how is it that I'm going to be able to zoom on this little piece of the graph? Well, I'm going to actually have to draw this. Uh, I mean, actually have to draw this function. Okay. All right. So let's do that. So let's switch over to uh, Desmos here, which I already have open, and let's fill in that formula. So let's see. It was y equals what was that? Um, 400, right? Uh, minus 16x squared, right? Ah, okay. And so you're looking at that and you're wondering, what in the heck is that? Looks like um, two straight lines, okay? But uh, that's because our graphing window here uh, is a little bit um, funky. So let's change the graphing window. Uh, for the x-axis, we only need to graph from what? Zero to five, right? Because um, it hits the ground after five seconds. Wasn't that correct? So I don't really care about all that portion of the x-axis. 
right? And then for the y-axis, we only need a graph from 0 to 400, right? Okay, because um, we know that uh, the height of the screwdriver is never more than um, 400, correct? Ah, okay. Ah, that looks a little bit better, right? Okay, so that was the graph that we were looking at just a moment ago. But now let's zoom in right at this particular point. What was happening to the screwdriver right here around the two-second mark? Okay, so I'm going to start blowing up this graph, but I've got to keep that point in my picture. So you'll have to help me here. So I'm going to start zooming in. Do I have two seconds there in the picture? Yeah, there's two seconds, right? Whoops, no. Okay, yeah, you're right. I don't. All right. All right. So there I've got it zoomed in. Let's zoom in a little bit more here. Okay. Do I have two seconds there in the picture? Yeah. Okay. And we can keep zooming in. All right. Actually, as much as we like. All right. But um, notice what's happening to the graph as you zoom in. Okay. That graph starts looking like just a what? A what? Yeah, see, notice you don't see the curvature anymore, right? You no longer see the curvature. All you see is just a straight line. Hmm, all we see is just a straight line. Now, what do we know about average rates of change of straight lines? They're constant, that's right. They're steady, okay? So you see, when you zoom in on this graph enough so that it looks like a straight line, then this average rate of change, no matter where you calculate it, between what two inputs you calculate in this picture, you're always going to get the same value, right? Okay, you're always going to get the same value. And that value happens to be the same as what? The, begins with an S there, the, the slope of the line, right? Okay, so here's what I claim. Since for this little piece of the graph here, which is from what, 1.9 to... Um, what is that? 2.2? Essentially, that screwdriver was falling at a steady rate, you see, because what we're seeing here is a straight line, right? Okay. The screwdriver doesn't have enough time here to speed up too, uh, uh, too much between 1.9 seconds and 2.1 seconds. So we might as well say that the speed of the screwdriver is whatever this uh, slope of this line is, right? Or whatever the average rate of change of this uh, line is, okay? That's the trick. That is a trick, the, the, actually the fundamental trick to calculus, okay? If you are given a curve, okay, if you uh, uh, blow it up enough, all curves turn out looking like what? What's that? A straight line, right, okay? And so we can treat essentially all curves like straight lines, okay? That is uh, 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 the fundamental uh, observation that uh, powers a lot of calculus. So we're going to answer that question. What was the uh, 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 speed of the screwdriver? What was the rate of change of this screwdriver after two seconds by calculating the average rate of change or the slope of this uh, line, okay? All right, so quickly here, I've got to find two points on the line. I've got two minutes to do it. Okay, so there's one point on the line. What does that look like? 1.9 and what? Can y'all read that? Well, that's 342. Write that down. So 1.9 and 342. Okay, it's actually a little bit above 342, but that's close enough. So there's one point on that. I called it a line, but really it's a curve, right? It just looks like a line. 1.9 and 342. And let's try one over here. Okay, let's find one that is um, pretty close. Oh, let's try this one. 2.05, so that's 2.05, and right about there is 3.33, okay? It's a little bit below 3.33, but I'm going to use 3.33, close enough, all right? Did y'all write those two points down? Okay, all right, calculate the slope between those two points for me, okay? All right, I'll see if I can quickly write it down on the page. So 
one a uh, two point zero five minus one point nine that was the denominator what was the numerator three forty two minus what three thirty three okay so in the top we have minus nine and in the bottom we have that point one five right and what does that turn out to be what now negative sixty exactly oh how perfect okay ah so there is our there is our answer to that question how fast was the screwdriver falling after two seconds okay it is negative because the uh, it is negative because the screwdriver is dropping right okay yeah so so how do you interpret this Simon <laughs> yeah yeah don't say you don't have to say on average anymore okay after two seconds what Perfect. Keep going. Was falling what? No, it's falling, right? There you go. 60 feet per second. That's right. Okay. There you have it. There's the speed after two seconds. It was going 60 feet per second. So if we looked at that speedometer, that's what we would have seen. 60 feet per second on that uh, speedometer. Okay. All right, so again, this now is our fourth way of computing change. This is called an instantaneous rate of change, not an average because we weren't calculating from uh, uh, one time to a second time. Here we were calculating uh, uh, the rate of change at exactly a particular instant, in this case, exactly after two seconds. Okay, I've got to stop there because um, I've already run into his time. All right, this is Mr. Johnson. He's going to tell you all something.